I get it intellectually that I was the target of family scapegoating abuse behaviors. So why don't I feel any anger about it? That's the subscriber question I'll be answering in this episode of Beyond Family Scapegoating Abuse. And if you stick around, I'll be sharing an exercise that I take my clients through to gently explore whether or not they might have some anger that they need to unpack. everyone. I'm Rebecca Mandeville, licensed psychotherapist, certified clinical trauma professional, and family systems and scapegoat expert. I'm also the author of Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed, Help and Hope for Adults in the Family Scapegoat Role. Today, we'll be talking about repressed anger. Repressed anger is anger that's held deeply in the unconscious, and you're not even aware it's there. That's different than suppressed anger. Suppressed anger is when you know that you have anger, but you don't express it and you hold it in. Anger is often seen as an emotion that if you're, uh, oh, spiritually aware or fully healed, you're not going to experience. And I personally and professionally couldn't disagree more. Anger is a much misunderstood and I think unappreciated emotion, and it can be a critical aspect of recovering from what I named family scapegoating abuse because anger is the force that creates adrenaline and can help us set appropriate boundaries. In the early days of our species, that sense of anger one might have felt when someone's coming into the cave to steal the bearskin rugs, sets that adrenaline going and helps a person defend themselves. And that might have ensured someone's survival, physical survival. I'd like to start off by talking a bit about my own repressed anger, anger that I was not conscious of at all even though I'm sure I exhibited angry behavior, especially when I was an adolescent. I went to my first therapist, a marriage family therapist like myself, when I was just about 20 years old. I knew that I didn't feel great. I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, but I didn't know really that I was anxious or depressed. Looking back now, it's so clear to me I'm sure some of you uh, have had that same experience when you're living it, especially when you're younger, you often just don't realize that you're suffering and what you're suffering from. So I remember going in for quite some time and shared quite a bit about my early childhood experiences. And one day, my therapist very gently said to me, I'll never forget it, Rebecca, do you ever feel angry? I was honestly taken aback by the question. I didn't understand why she was asking me that. My entire sense of self was based on my feeling like I was a nice person, a caring person, uh, tried to help people. I wondered if she was seeing something that I wasn't aware of that I should be concerned about. I actually even said to her, no, I'm not angry. I really don't ever feel angry. And I meant it. I don't remember what happened from there. Uh, I do know I probably was not at all ready to start to explore whether I could be carrying a tremendous load of repressed anger. Today, I understand that I definitely was. I've also gently uh, invited clients to explore whether they might have some repressed anger in regard to what happened to them in their families, especially my clients who are in the family scapegoat role. I won't ask this question early on. Um, Usually what I will do is notice and observe. And clients that have repressed anger will often have somaticized it to some degree, meaning they'll have a lot of physical complaints or they'll have uh, chronic illnesses, mystery illnesses, uh, all over body joint pain. 
And that does not always mean someone's holding on to anger, but it has been the case where uh, clients have eventually been able to unpack that anger and noticed, and pretty quickly too, um, a complete remission of some pain that they'd been having that had never really been diagnosed and was very debilitating. I also know that people are often very traumatized when they come to me, suffering from complex trauma symptoms, uh, other types of trauma, family scapegoat trauma symptoms. And so I know that they're likely somewhat dissociated, perhaps somewhat disconnected from their body. That's not always true, but it is often the case. They may be self-medicating, engaging in some addictive behaviors, or um, be addicted, so to speak, to controlling people, places, and things in an attempt to feel safe. Those are also clues that tell me that I may need to be exploring the possibility of repressed anger with my client. Certain types of behaviors can tell me that someone might be holding on to repressed anger. That would be self-sabotaging behaviors, people-pleasing, fawning, what we might call uh, codependent behaviors, almost going to the opposite presentation of uh, what the client might be exhibiting if they were in touch with the anger. Clients' cultural backgrounds, um, their individual family culture, what type of religion they might have been exposed to or grown up in, those also can influence how someone is experiencing anger. Uh, it also offers more hints as to why that anger may have had to been pushed down. And most importantly, you may have pushed down that anger unconsciously as a survival response, particularly if you've been experiencing various types of abuse in your family of origin since early childhood. That is because anger is a very big emotion. It might come out with a very young child in the form of a temper tantrum, and many children get shamed around that but that child is releasing some big emotions. It also can be very unsafe to release these types of big emotions, especially anger in a dysfunctional or narcissistic family system. We know in family systems that emotions are often divided up between family members. This isn't done consciously, of course, but often these highly dysfunctional or narcissistic families are very enmeshed and emotions are not fully experienced in any one family member. They're kind of like a big glob in the middle of the family system and, and certain people are allowed to have certain emotions. So the family power holder, for example, is often the one who can have any emotion they want, especially anger. If there's a codependent or an enabling spouse, they often will be the one mitigating the abuse, so to speak, trying to smooth things over. And so they might be the softer parent. The empath child often can end up, as I mentioned earlier, being the family member that does repress the anger because it's what we call ego dystonic. That was the case for me. I didn't identify as someone who could have anger because I like to think of myself as a, a kind, caring person. I was kind of the little mini counselor for everyone from a very early age. And being angry just seemed like something that couldn't possibly be associated with my egoic identity. I understand that today. I couldn't have possibly understood that when I was younger. Children and adult children who carry a lot of toxic shame or guilt or religious guilt often also will repress anger. And so a client that exhibits symptoms of toxic shame, toxic shame is also unconscious, by the way, that's what makes it different than ordinary shame. Clients that come in saying there must be something wrong with me. What did I do to make my family treat me this way? They're blaming themselves for their family's inappropriate or abusive behaviors. I know I'm probably going to find a lot of unconscious toxic shame there. And that also can go along with repressed anger. Clients that come to me with a lot of um, 
hypoarousal symptoms. This is a term we use in the trauma treatment field. A client who uh, talks about feeling depressed uh, most of the time or all of the time, a client who feels lethargic, a client who has trouble getting out of bed and functioning, um, doesn't find life worth living, perhaps has suicidal ideation, that often can be unconscious, repressed anger turned on the self. Uh, literally, the depression, it, 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 what's being depressed, pushed down, is anger. So that will get my attention when a client presents to me with those kinds of hypoarousal symptoms. Clients who engage in a lot of escapist activities, uh, have a lot of uh, addictive behaviors, drinking drugs, over shopping, uh, any sort of escapist addictive type behavior. Sometimes that will also indicate there may be some repressed anger there. Another thing to keep in mind is if you had a parent that had no trouble being angry and perhaps was violent and even violent towards you, on some level, you may have decided you're never going to be like that and you associated anger with that parent, in this case, possibly a parent, an authority figure in the family or a dominant sibling. And on some level, you, you associate anger with being just like that person. That also can lead to repressed anger. Another thing to consider is, uh, are you someone who is able to easily feel sadness or grief, but you don't seem to be able to feel anger? Sometimes we can live in cultures that promote ideas that it's okay for men to be angry, it's okay for women to be sad, but women who are angry are usually called the B word, starts with a B, ends with a CH, and men who grieve or express sadness are viewed as weak. So ask yourself if you grew up having that message conveyed to you. Sometimes it will be the case that uh, someone comes to me, including some male clients that have come to me, and they're very much able to feel grief, disenfranchised grief, estrangement grief, all kinds of grief, and they're able to feel sad and uh, sad about what happened to them and their family, but they are just not able to access that anger. So sometimes sadness and grief are more comfortable feelings um, and aren't always connected to what you were taught. It could also be related to genetics, to how your brain's wired. So again, as I say in so many of my videos, it's never definitely this, definitely that, one thing or the other. It, human beings are complex. Our psyches are extraordinarily complex. And you can be curious about why you may not be able to express anger or access anger. I hope I've given you some ideas and some paths that you can go down to contemplate, maybe to journal on. But that hopefully will get you started in understanding that if you were abused in your family, you may have a load of anger there unconsciously. And if you have ever felt stuck in your recovery progress, feeling impulsive, self-destructive, a lot of negative self-talk, you might be a person who uses sarcasm a lot. And by the way, the, the Latin root of the word sarcasm is to tear flesh, poor relationships, difficulty concentrating, numbness, apathy, those symptoms and more can indicate you may have some repressed anger. So once we've established that my client may indeed have repressed anger, how do I go about helping them? One of the first things I might do is help the client to stand back a bit and look at their situation and what happened to them in their family as if it happened to someone else. So I might ask, gee, if that happened to your child or if that happened to someone you care deeply about, what would you be feeling? What would you be thinking? And that's a way that one can tentatively start to explore the possibility of what might it be like if they were feeling appropriate anger or righteous rage. So something that you could possibly try is get a journal and 
write down situations you've been through as if they happened to someone you cared about and then write how you feel about that. That's a simple way to start. Uh, if you feel overly triggered while doing it, remember to take breaks, do your vagal breathing exercise, which I've posted a video on that in my community tab here. And take your time because this work is important and ideally it's work you would be doing with a trauma-informed licensed mental health professional. I know not all of you can do that. So I just wanted to give you some ideas of how you could start exploring anger in gentle ways that hopefully won't feel too triggering. As you're journaling, you might notice body sensations. Um, check in with yourself as you're writing, as you're imagining what it would be like to witness what happened to you, happened to someone you care about. Is your heart going faster? Is your breathing escalating? Um, you know, are you feeling flushed? Are you feeling a stomach ache come on? Your body's sending signals. And those signals may be being sent to you far more than you realize, and you're just not tuning into them. And if you're still in contact with family that's scapegoating you, it could feel dangerous to be in tune with your body present to your body's health-seeking signals, as I like to call it. Um, it also could be threatening to get in touch with anger because you might then become very aware that you're not being treated well, you're being abused. And you need to set boundaries or limit or end contact. That can be tricky. So there may be a point when your anger is more suppressed than repressed. You realize you have it, but you're not able to act on it. And that's a phase you may need to go through. I'll be talking more about how to get in touch with anger. But I really want to introduce this idea of repressed anger and how to access it slowly. Again, anger helps us to know when we're violated. Anger helps us have the adrenaline needed to act on our own behalf, or anger can help our body let us know when we're in harm's way. There's a poem that I like referring my clients to by the Persian mystic poet Rumi, R-U-M-I, and this is called The Guest House, translation by Coleman Barks. And I encourage you to go take a look at that poem. You can find it online. And this idea of embracing all your emotions, no matter what they are, including anger, is expressed so beautifully in this poem. I'll link it to you, in fact, in the video description here if you want to check it out. I wanted to give you a friendly reminder that my first survey of 2023 is posted and available on my website, which is also in the video description, scapegoatrecovery.com. The survey is available on my menu, and I'm closing it August 15th, so you still have a few more days if you'd like to contribute to my research on family scapegoating abuse and family scapegoat trauma. I'm going to also release two more surveys this year. And some of the questions on the next two surveys are a direct result of some great feedback I've gotten from many of you here. And so know that your presence matters, your voice counts, and it is influencing my research surveys as I work to get the word out on this type of abuse, family scapegoating abuse, and the kinds of trauma related to family scapegoating so that there's more awareness including in the mental health profession, about what adult survivors have gone through, are going through, and what types of support they need so that they can heal. I hope you have some better understanding of why you may have repressed anger if you're concerned that you're not able to access anger. And I will, again, make future videos about this. And I would love to hear from you in the comments if you've been through this, what helped you get in touch with your anger, or let me know if something in this video helped you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.